Hello everyone and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. Modern Aircraft Carriers The Giants of the Sea Rely on immense propulsion systems to move their floating air bases across the world's oceans. At the heart of this system are the propeller shafts and screws, massive pieces of engineering designed to convert nuclear or conventional power into raw thrust. Each carrier is fitted with multiple propeller shafts, sometimes extending over 100 meters from the engine rooms to the stern. These shafts transmit rotational power from turbines directly to bronze alloy propellers, each weighing 30 tons or more. Turning slowly but with tremendous torque, the propellers generate enough thrust to drive 100,000-ton vessels through the water at speeds exceeding 30 knots. The construction of an aircraft carrier propeller begins with precision metallurgy. High-strength nickel-aluminum bronze alloys are cast in specialized foundries to withstand decades of stress, saltwater corrosion, and cavitation forces. The molten metal is poured into carefully designed molds, cooled, and then machined with computer-guided tools to achieve flawless blade geometry. Each blade's curvature and pitch are vital, ensuring efficiency and stability for the enormous vessel. Once complete, installation becomes a feat of heavy engineering. Shipyard cranes and floating dry docks are employed to carefully position the propeller beneath the ship's stern. Divers and engineers align the massive hub with the tail shaft, fastening it with giant nuts and hydraulic jacks. Tolerances are measured in millimeters, despite the colossal scale of the equipment. Finally, the system is tested. Shafts are rotated, bearings lubricated, and alignment verified before the vessel is launched. When the carrier sails, its propellers churn the sea with unseen power, silently propelling one of the most complex machines ever built. The building of U.S. Navy supercarriers takes years to complete. The USS Gerald R. Ford, which would go on to become the world's largest aircraft carrier and, in terms of displacement, the largest warship ever constructed. The vessel is also the lead ship of her class, which goes by the same name. These are the most advanced aircraft carriers in the U.S. fleet, measuring over 1,000 feet in length and capable of carrying up to 80 aircraft at a time. Construction was an immense undertaking, starting back in 2005 and lasting until it was officially commissioned in 2017. Though it has yet to be deployed, the USS Gerald R. Ford has already become the heart of the U.S. Navy. As with many U.S. Navy vessels, the Gerald R. Ford was constructed at the Newport News Shipbuilding Facilities in Virginia. To date, nine Nimitz-class aircraft carriers and dozens of other ships have been constructed here. Designated the CVN-78, the Gerald R. Ford project was initiated on August 11th with a ceremonial steel cut, 
This piece of steel would eventually go on to form part of the carrier's side shell. The construction process was slow going until two years later when the various components of the ship began to come together and take shape. Despite the shipbuilder's 100-plus year history of designing and building military vessels, the Gerald R. Ford contained numerous first-in-class design changes. For instance, it was the first U.S. aircraft carrier to incorporate the new Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System, or EMALS, which uses a linear induction motor rather than a steam piston. This accelerates aircraft much more smoothly, putting less strain on their airframes. Other design features include more automation to facilitate operations with a smaller crew and a new A1B nuclear reactor, which is less complicated yet generates more power. Lastly, the EMAL system is complemented by a new advanced arresting gear system, which uses electromagnetics for energy absorption, so that unmanned drones can be landed with less chance of damage. Aircraft carriers have been under consideration by global military powers since the invention of the airplane. In fact, just seven years after the Wright brothers' historic first flight, flight tests were already being conducted from the decks of ships. The U.S. commissioned its first carrier in 1922 eager to mobilize its quickly expanding air power. By World War II, aircraft had become of massive strategic importance, and the number of aircraft carriers exploded worldwide. The United States Navy employed some 105 carriers during the conflict while the Royal Navy had around 14. Over time, the planes became more advanced and more capable, as did the technology aboard the carriers themselves. The ship's rudimentary catapults were replaced with more powerful and reliable catabar system, and the ships grew exponentially. Modern aircraft carriers like the Nimitz and Gerald R. Ford classes are literally floating cities capable of being deployed all around the world. They carry crews numbering between three and 5,000, as well as billions of dollars in technology designed to make them virtually impervious to enemy attack. Gone are the straight, square decks of the past, with most modern carriers favoring a slanted landing deck with two dedicated catapult areas, doubling the number of planes that can be launched in any given period. The improvements have certainly been effective, the last time an aircraft carrier was sunk in wartime was in July of 1945. 
and though 12 U.S. carriers were lost during World War II, no foreign power has managed to sink a U.S. carrier since the Bismarck sank at the Battle of Iwo Jima. While aircraft carriers can be updated and refitted, they can't last forever. But once a carrier has been decommissioned by the U.S. Navy, it must undergo a long journey before officially being laid to rest. The USS Forrestal, which served for 38 years as one of the first United States supercarriers, was decommissioned in 1993. It has taken more than a decade to remove the sensitive information, data, and technology from inside. In 2014, it was sailed from Philadelphia down to Texas, where it would be torn apart for scrap. After all, these ships contain hundreds of thousands of pounds of valuable metal that can be easily torn out, recycled, and reused for various purposes. The first combat submarines date all the way back to World War I. Since then, they have been absolutely integral to the operation of many navies around the world. True to their name, these stealthy sea vehicles can submerge to depths of 2,500 feet, allowing them to attack and defend using a variety of weapons and tactics. The construction process for a modern submarine is quite different from that of a surface vessel. For instance, many submarines feature two holes, an inner one and an outer one. These holes are generally made of plate steel curved by heavy rollers. These are then welded together into sections, which are connected to form the inner hole. The purpose of this is to create several watertight compartments, which can help protect the sub if one part of the hole is compromised. An outer hole is later constructed around the pressured section. This is what generally gives the sub its unique tube shape. The launching process of a newly designed submarine is fairly standard, however. The sub is generally placed inside a gated, manufactured canal known as a dry dock. Once in place, the dry dock can be pumped full of water until it is at an equal level with the water outside the gate. The gate is then opened, allowing the submarines to exit directly into the adjoining waterway. This dry dock procedure is a bit different. It uses a solely submersible platform that can be dropped beneath the water in order to retrieve a vessel that is already in the water. The large platform already has the necessary rollers and platforms to support the incoming vessel. Once it is low enough, the submarine, in this case, the USS Pasadena, can be assisted into position by several tugboats. From here, the platform is slowly raised, allowing the water to flow back out and giving maintenance crews full access to all sections of the ship. The lifts powering this dry dock need to be extremely powerful, as Los Angeles-class submarines, like the Pasadena, weigh as much as 6,000 tons. Just because a submarine has been officially launched, does not necessarily mean it's ready for service. First, the vessel needs to undergo a rigorous set of evaluations known as sea trials. In the case of the USS Montana, a Virginia-class submarine launched in 2020, those trials tested nearly every aspect of the submarine's design and systems. These included evaluating propulsion, weapons systems, dive systems, and more. At the cost of $2.7 billion, it is crucial to ensure that the Montana can perform every duty it might encounter, as well as some that are outside its normal mission. The Montana was put through a variety of high-speed maneuvers, both on top of and under the water. Towering flight decks of supercarriers to the stealthy hulls of modern submarines, these engineering marvels represent the very peak of naval technology. Each propeller forged, each shaft aligned, 
And each whole section welded reflects not only decades of design evolution, but also the determination of thousands of skilled hands. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.